Amen. Thank you so much, Scott and the praise team. Great to see you today. It is a great day in Albuquerque. Wonderful to see those here live at 9 a.m. Great to see you online at 10.30 a.m. And uh, so Sunday mornings, I don't know what time it is anymore because we record the 9 a.m. and play it live on YouTube at 10.30. And then at 10.30, we're live on Facebook Live. So if I seem to have a split personality, it's because I don't know to whom I'm speaking. But uh, all jesting aside, it is a great, great day. And I'm so excited about the passage that we get to study together today. And, uh, but first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these who are here face to face, for those who are watching this online. And Lord, thank you that you uh, are the pastor of our church and you have so beautifully held our church together during this unusual time. And thank you for what you're doing and how you're moving and working. And God, I pray today that you would take your word, that you would tailor it for each one here and listening online, for each person, Lord, that you would speak your truth very clearly, that you would comfort and encourage and challenge and remind and correct in all the things that you do in my life and in our lives with your word. Lord, as we pray today, we pray for Emmanuel Missionary Church here in town, one of our sister churches, that you would equip them, protect them, use them to reach the lost. And then we pray for Mike and Morgan from New Mexico in East Asia, and just pray that you'd do a great work in their lives, protect them physically, spiritually, use them to reach the lost and to make disciples. God, do a work in Albuquerque, we pray, we anticipate, we look forward to what you will do in these weeks and months and years ahead to get glory in Albuquerque. Renew, restore, heal, change. And God, speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Habakkuk. Now, I cheated. I have a bookmark in mine. For those of you who weren't in Bible drill, we'll give you a few moments to find Habakkuk. Short little book. And uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 today. Habakkuk, we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. It's just to the right of Nahum, if you get there. Habakkuk chapter 1. Well, the nation formerly followed the Lord, sought the Lord. Even the leadership back in those days were God-fearers, but things changed. Now the leadership has changed. As a matter of fact, there's even a leader who was put in place by the meddling of a foreign nation. And now righteousness is hard to find. Now there's violence and corruption and strife and contention. And when the righteous try to do something good, they're surrounded by the evil and nothing good seems to come of it. Some of that sounds a little bit familiar, but it's actually from 605 B.C. when Habakkuk wrote his short book. Habakkuk chapter 1. Now, Habakkuk, we don't really know anything about him. His name means to embrace, and so there's not a whole lot to make out of that. I know God had something there, but we're not told anything about his, his, uh, his life except for this letter. He writes around, as I mentioned, around 605 B.C., and uh, Josiah had been that righteous king. Josiah was the one who sought the Lord and sought to ish, uh, usher in reforms to the nation to turn them towards God. It was during Josiah's reign that the lost book of the law was found. And there were all of these good things. But Josiah was killed in the battle of Megiddo by the Egyptians. For three months, his next son reigned, Jehoaz, but uh, he only lasted three months, pretty short reign, and Egypt captured him, took him off, and so they took the next son, Eliakim, and put him in as king, installed him as king, and named him Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim was not righteous at all, and uh, he was evil, as we read about him over in the books of Kings. He did not seek the Lord. And so Habakkuk tells us, 
about a conversation with God. Most prophets spoke uh, on behalf of God to the people, but Habakkuk lets us see a conversation that he is having with God. So we read these first 11 verses. The oracle, the word means the burden which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence and yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Let's just stop there for a few minutes this morning. Here again is Habakkuk. He's frustrated. Habakkuk knows his Bible. And he knows what God promised, that if God's people, and Habakkuk is speaking uh, from Judah and to Judah, but to God about Judah, and writing to Judah, this is during that split kingdom. Habakkuk knows what God promised. God said, if my people turn against me, I'll send judgment. And Habakkuk says, where is it, God? I don't see you doing anything. And everywhere I look, he says, I see violence. I see wickedness, destruction strife, contention, your law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, silencing the righteous. He says, because of the wicked surrounding the righteous, the judgment that's supposed to come out of there, out of the righteous, it's, it's convoluted. Nothing seems to make any progress for the right. Sound familiar? Yeah, it sounds familiar. And we're not the first Americans to think this sounds familiar. Uh, some have said God owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology if he doesn't send judgment on America. I mean, we just celebrated July 4th. Outside of Israel, it, you'd be hard-pressed to find a nation, at least a sizable nation, who's been as blessed by God. The church and the nation are separate entities. We don't, we don't worship America. But as one said, when I get, thank God for my food, I'm not worshiping my food. I'm thanking God. So I thank God for America. And I'm not worshiping America. I'm thanking God for how he's blessed us and led us and positioned us and used us. But we would not have much difficulty knowing that we deserve judgment in many areas from the Lord. We have turned from him in so many areas. Unfortunately, it always starts with the church. Revival starts with the church, but turning from God starts with the church over the years as well because those who don't know God, they, they don't turn from God. They never knew God. So we have to take the blame for the, the church as a whole over the years. The church has stopped teaching certain things that the Scripture is very clear about. The church has changed. Well, we used to teach this, now we teach that. And, and when you start digging in, it's usually not because we've discovered something new biblically. It's because culture pushes in on us. And then when the church begins to change, then actions from believers and actions certainly from those who aren't believers begin to change. And we no longer blush at sin and our attitudes and our words, we begin to say, nothing really is that big a deal. And then it affects the entire nation, and the nation begins to change laws, laws that were based on God's Word, and now changing what is legal, legalizing abortion for sure. Some of the legalizations, the, the extra rights given to those living in the sinful lifestyle of homosexuality certain substances, and on and on and on we go. And so we would say with Habakkuk here, Lord, uh, people have turned from you. What will you do about it? But note this, a couple of things here about Habakkuk's prayer of complaint to God. He's complaining not for his own inconvenience. He's complaining not because it just irks him, but he's complaining for the glory of God. Do we? Is your heart, is your prayer life in these matters more about, God, you deserve glory in our land. 
Or is your prayer life more about, God, when will you get them? I'm going to be preaching the book of Revelation, Lord willing, beginning in September. I was turned off from teaching the book of Revelation for years as, as a young man because of those who might heard teach the book of Revelation. And the theme of the teaching many times was God's going to get them. Well, that's true, but that's not the heart of the book of Revelation. The heart of the book of Revelation, although we will study the best I can tell, and I'll tell you that what I will teach you about the timeline and the events is up for debate, and we'll know in the air, and then we'll know exactly. So we'll look at those things, but the heart of the book of Revelation is God is coming back, so we need to be ready, and we need to be getting the lost ready because the day will come when it will be too late. And that's Habakkuk here. He's not saying, God, this is bothersome to me. He's saying, God, where is your glory in this? How will you move and act and work to preserve your name? And then within that, we are reminded that Habakkuk is crying out, he says. God, he says at least twice here, I've cried to you. I've cried to you, and I don't hear anything. Are we crying to the Lord? Are we praying for our city? Are we praying for our nation? Or are we throwing up our hands and saying, ah, it could never change? It can change. God can change our city and our nation. And he will do so in response to our prayers because he allows us to be a part of that. He will do so as we get right with him, as revival comes in our lives and in our church. But no city, no person, no nation is beyond God's ability to change it. So he offers a complaint to God, and it's okay to be honest with God. But then God answers in a way that surprises Habakkuk, beginning in verse 5. He says, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. And this is one of those verses where, as one said, my life was changed by a verse taken out of context. Uh, there are songs from this verse, God's doing a new thing, and it always sounds so exciting, but it really wasn't very exciting. He says, oh, I'm doing something. Oh, Habakkuk, I hear you. I haven't missed any of these things that you're talking to me about, and yeah, I'm about to work, and you would never believe it if I told you what I was about to do. And then God tells him, what he's about to do. Can you rewind back to February, January of 2020? You remember years ago? Can you rewind and imagine if I had come to the pulpit or if you and I had been having coffee? In fact, there's a man in this room on March 11th when the coronavirus hit New Mexico, he and I had breakfast that morning. And if that morning at breakfast you had told me that the coronavirus would hit New Mexico. We'd heard about it. It was out there. It was just one of those things off in Asia, you know. It was going to hit New Mexico. The churches would be closed for over two months except for live stream, and then partially after that, and that stores and restaurants and schools and every other event you can imagine would be closed, and that there would be health order after health order and mandatory masks, and that then there would be racial tension that would erupt into protests and then into riots and into the destruction of many, most major downtowns in America. And then that statues that have existed, good or bad, for hundreds of years would be toppled. Even the statues of men who agreed with the movement. And on. And on, I, I just said, that's, that's neat, that's funny. Because we've gotten to that point now where when something happens in 2020, we say, oh, okay, sure, it's 2020, why not? And God says, I'm answering, but it's not the way that you thought it would look. And then in verse 6, he says, for behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, who were the Chaldeans? Well, in 9th century B.C., the Chaldeans were an ethnic group in southern Babylon. 
But they gradually grew in power until by the time of most of the minor prophet writings and major prophet writings, you, when you hear Chaldeans, it means the Babylonians. They now are essentially the entire nation. Well, the Chaldeans had risen in power not just in Babylon, but now they were on a massive crusade in battle after battle. So here's what happened. First, the Egyptians conquered Judah, as I mentioned. Josiah was killed in the battle at Megiddo. But then just three and a half or so years later in the battle of Carchemish, those mighty Egyptians who had conquered Judah were defeated handily by the Chaldeans. And so their conquerors had been conquered. So they must be mighty and fearful. And God says, I'm bringing them. I'm going to judge my people through the Chaldeans. For behold, in verse 6, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people, who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They're dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. That's not a good place for your justice and authority to originate with yourself. They're their own judge. Their horses are swifter than leopards. And keener than wolves in the evening, their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. We're tying in this word back to Habakkuk's complaint. Twice in that complaint, he talked about violence. And he says, they're bringing violence on my people. Verse 9, their horde of faces moves forward. They collect, collect captives like sand. Those that they conquer and take into possession, you can't number them like you can't number the sand. Verse 10, they mock at kings, and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it, and then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on. If we could only imagine Habakkuk, he's speechless. He's, he's complained to God. And God says, I hear you. And the answer is not at all what he wanted. For this God-fearing, righteousness-seeking prophet of Judah to imagine that his Judah would be judged by a heathen nation, ruthless, violent, heathen nation, he, he, he just, he was speechless. And we're going to get so we move on to some of the rest of God's explanation and Habakkuk's understanding. But God does things in ways that we don't always understand. And yet, he's moving. We can't take each event. We can't say, well, now this one was the judgment of God. This one wasn't. This one was because of my fault. This was because of our fault. This wasn't our fault. We, we looked at that in the book of Job. We can't decipher all of those things. None of us. Lamentation says, how can any mortal man complain in light of his sins? None of us can say that God has done things and we just don't deserve them at all because we're sinners. We turn from God. And yet there are some things that are happening in my life, in your life, in our nation, our city, our world, that are judgments of God on the righteous, on the unrighteous, there are some things that God just knows that are best, but God will take even wrong things and use them for his glory and to accomplish his ways. We see this over and over in the Old Testament where God will take the evil intentions of a nation like the Chaldeans and then he'll allow it, he'll channel it to judge his people. And at the end of verse 11 it says, but they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. It's an amazing thing that God does. You've heard me mention it before. But then God will take their evil intentions, use their evil intentions to judge his people so that he can woo his people back to him. And then when it's all over, he will send super judgment on those whose evil intentions he used to judge his people. He's masterful. He's wise. He's moving. He's working. Are you watching today and you're locked down? I mean, I know there's some that you are you're locked, you haven't been out of your house a time or two in months. Surprise, it's God. Did God bring the coronavirus? 
Did God use, was it man-made? And child? I don't know. Whether God meant it, he's using it in our lives. Are there folks taking the coronavirus and doing not right things with it and using it for their advantage here and there? Maybe. But God's behind it, and he's using it, and he could stop it. Surprise. It's God. Are you out of work? Surprise. It's God. Do you have relationships that are falling apart? There are people treating you unfairly. Surprise. It's God. Did God want them to treat you unfairly? No. But he's at work. He's using it. And on and on, there are things in your life today that I would remind you that God is at work in those things. He writes last chapters. Just like the Babylonians, justice will come either on this earth or in the future, those who are doing wrong in your life, God will judge them. It's not that God wants people to do wrong, but even in those things that we say, God couldn't be in this, he is. He's behind it, allowing it, using it, sending it. I can't answer that for you. But nothing comes down the path of my life that God didn't either send or allow for then God would be helpless, and he's not. Surprise, it's God. Well, what do we do? What do we do while we wait and say, COVID, God, you're using that? Oh, he is using that. We see a bunch of ways he's using it, and there's a bunch of ways we don't know. I see him strengthening churches. I see him causing churches to reevaluate what's important, what's not. We, we kind of no longer have any traditions in effect. I see him strengthening relationships in churches and church members ministering to one another outside the walls of the church. So many pastors I've spoken with, I've seen him provide for churches. Every church leader, when this hit, feared what this would do to, to offerings, to the work of the church, to the commitments we have, to the ministries that we have. This church, like so, others, so many others, God has provided for through your faithfulness. Don't stop. I see churches growing relationally. I see spouses watching worship, spouses who either don't know the Lord or too proud to come to church for some reason or the other, and now they're worshiping every week online. We see people watching, attending church virtually who weren't interested in attending church before. There are folks around this nation coming to Christ through this. On and on, God's using it. Do I like it? Not a bit. But God's at work. And that's the way it is in your life, in our homes, in all of these things that we'd say, I, I don't like this, but God is at work in it. So what do we do in closing? The theme verse some have pointed out for this entire book is in chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, as for the proud, one, his soul is not right within me, but this last phrase, but the righteous will live by his faith. Of course, this is quoted over in Romans. This is true to the whole Scripture. In the middle of this season, and the biggest thing in your life as you're watching and as you're here alive, the biggest thing in your life may have nothing to do with this virus. Whatever that thing is that you're having a hard time wrapping your head around that God is actually using this, that you would have, you would have to say, that's really hard for me to realize, surprise, it's God. In the midst of that, the righteous live by faith. So if you don't know Christ as Savior, what does that mean? It means the same thing that Martin Luther found it to mean when he read this verse quoted over in Romans. He had tried to be religious. He had beat himself to try to punish himself for his own sin. He did everything. He crawled on his knees up the stairs in Rome trying to please God with anything he could do. He spent hour after hour after hour in the confession booth until the priest would send him away and say, stop but he never knew Christ until teaching through the book of Romans in a seminary. He came across the New Testament version of this verse, the righteous will live by faith. Some of you today online need to realize for the first time, religion is not going to get you to God. Religion will not give you the freedom 
the peace, the joy of knowing you know Christ, and that if you died the day, you'd spend eternity with God in heaven. And you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to stop today and say, I admit that I'm a sinner, and I finally admit that there's nothing I can do to ever achieve salvation except what Christ did for me. And so today, I choose to put my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross to die for and to come to life again, to pay for the penalty and the power of my sin. And in just a moment, you'd place your faith in Jesus Christ. But then believers, in these odd times, we would live by faith. And we'd say, Lord, I don't know exactly what you're doing or why, but you are using this. And I choose to put my faith in you and to say, Lord, use this to bring revival in my life, to bring revival in our church, and then to send spiritual awakening to the lost world around. Today, can you just step back again and say, God, I believe you're working. I believe you're moving even when I don't understand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to me this week. Thank you for your word to your people. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful truth that you're always at work, you're always in control, and that you can take the things which are unpleasant, even the things that are evil, and you can channel them to use them for your glory and to bring about your purposes in my life, in my family, in this church, and in the world around. And God, we pray, help us as we have grown into a little bit of fatigue in this current season, kind of tired of it. Wherever we stand on it, still all of us sharing that mutual feeling of just being tired of it. And so God, help us to not lose sight of the need for us to cry out to you and pray that you'll keep using whatever tool you wish to bring revival in our lives and spiritual awakening in the world. Oh God, help us to become righteous by faith and then to live as the righteous, declared righteous by you, to live by faith, never losing hope, never losing faith, knowing that you are at work, you are moving, and we can trust you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.